everyone. We're here for a city council meeting tonight. It is Monday, May 18th, 2020. We'll start this meeting with a roll call and determination of quorum. Nordstrom, here. Roberts, here. Stroman, here. Armstrong, here. Lewis, here. Lehman, here. Drury, here. Evans, here. Drew. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. And then next we'll have uh, our invocation tonight from Pastor Liz Aw followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for the opportunity to be here and thank you, dear Lord, for our beautiful city. I want to thank you, dear Lord, for, for our mayor and his staff and these dedicated men and women who are here as the city council. And we just pray, dear Lord, that you would guide them tonight, you know, the decisions before them, and I just pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment to know what decisions they need to make and and how to best lead our city you know there's extra challenges right now because of the COVID-19 and I just pray dear Lord that you would give them the insight that they need to know exactly how to guide our city through this this uncertain time and I pray that you would um, be with the, us as citizens that we would be supportive and encouraging and and um, that we would just be in unison as a city walking through this time. We thank you that we live in this beautiful area and we thank you that we can trust this fine council to you tonight and just guide them in each thing. We ask for your blessing and we ask for your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank Okay, and now for the adoption of the agenda. This is a time when the council may adopt the agenda as written or make additions or modifications to it. And I would like to make uh, an addition to this agenda. Uh, I would like to add item 32A, which is to authorize funding for the emergency shelter of up to $75,000. And uh, Daryl Shoemaker now is running copies off of the paperwork that goes with it, and he'll bring it back to the council. And then I'll explain more when we get to that um, item. But this is an oversight on my part for not having it on the agenda earlier. So moved. Okay. Um, motion to approve with that addition by Armstrong, second by Lewis. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, and now on to general public comment. We have uh, one speaker here um, for general public comment. We have two others for item number 30. So uh, for general public comment, Stanton Anchor. And as uh, always, We'll have three minutes for general public comment and anyone else speaking here publicly can watch these lights. Go ahead, sir. All right. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm here uh, in my capacity as president of the Rapid City Racer Swim Team. I'm also here as a father of one of the kids who swims on that team, my 10-year-old daughter, Abigail. Um, I know that this is a tough time for the city uh, especially for the Parks and Rec Department. Know that there's been a lot of discussion about not opening up the swimming pools at all this summer. And I'm just here to speak, trying to urge the City Council to consider opening up the swimming pools. It's a benefit for the community as a whole, for everybody, for their health, their mental and physical well-being. 
Uh, I understand that there's some monetary issues right now with what's going on. But as far as the safety for swimming goes, USA Swimming has come out with guidelines on what swim teams can do and the public can, how they can utilize pools to be safe, to limit the number of people in the lanes and to be safe with it. Uh, we are briefed um, weekly by USA Swimming on these new guidelines as they're updated. And I can tell you that the swim teams and the public can safely use the pools using the USA Swimming guidelines. So I would just ask that the City Council consider opening up the pools for this summer so that, uh, like I said, it's for the mental and physical well-being of the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. And that'll conclude the general public comment tonight. Other public comments were made. You're speaking on item 30, Nick, and we'll call your name and when we get closer to that item. Okay, that's, so that's the end of general public comment. Mayor, I'd ask for a point of privilege. Okay, a point of privilege by Darla Drew. Go ahead. Um, we have a local election coming up, and as most of you have seen and people watching know, the council is a really important part of the uh, makeup of your community and where your community is led. Um, you know, we are not superhuman. We're just people that really cared enough to step up. And we have a race on June 2nd for our school board and also for city council. Two of the city council races are even unopposed. Laura Armstrong and Richie Nordstrom are unopposed. They are fantastic leaders. They're great council people. But I think that it, it makes for a better democracy when folks step up and run. You know, everybody has to rethink what they really stand for when they have to run against a competitor. So with that in mind, um, Greg Stroman, Laura Armstrong, and myself are launching a campaign called Vote Local. It's keyed off the Buy Local campaign. We're go you're going to be seeing our logo around a lot just to remind people that voting local will affect you far more, and you've seen it in the last few months, than presidential campaigns, governorships, a lot of those things, because we were the ones that voted for the closures of social businesses. We were the ones that voted for the opening of it. Your streets, your uh, building permits, uh, parking meters, all those things you know, come through us to be decided. So if you really want to be part of this, if you want to complain and, uh, or compliment, which does happen for us every now and then, <laughs> Um, please vote. Know who you're voting for, find out what they support, find out a little bit about them, and then vote your heart and make sure you get out and vote on June 2nd or even before that because it is really important and I think these last three months have proved that more than any time that I've ever seen in this community. So thank you for the point of privilege, Mayor, and remember, vote local. Okay. Now on to non-public hearing items, 1 through 34, and we'll open public comment on 1 through 25. We have no speaker requests on those items. So we'll go on to consent items, 1 through 25. Would the council like to um, remove any of these items for independent discussion or approve the consent calendar? Motion to approve by Lewis. Second. Second by Roberts. All in favor of approval say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Now to non-consent items 26 through 34. We'll open public comment on those items. We have two speaker requests. First one from Nick Urey. Hello, thank you for letting me speak. Um, just to let you guys know, we didn't pay our property tax on time. I sent a letter to the Department of Equalization, to some of our senators, and to the governor. And I would just like to take this time to read it in. To whom it concerns, we will not be paying our property tax due on April 30th, 2020. We are not saying that we do not owe property tax. 
We are simply stating that we are not going to make a payment. There is something fundamentally wrong with a government that deprives us of our ability to make money revenue and then demand that we pay that government that deprived us that right. Our business was and still is financially hurt by this selective shutdown. The Grand Gateway Hotel is a full service hotel, which means we have a 24 hour restaurant, a bar, pool, meeting facilities. Because of the nature of this activity, we were forced to close our bar, our pool, and the 24 hour restaurant. This deprived us of properly selling our hotel and its offerings. I raised this concern at the City Council that were held on several occasions. I have spoken to the Director of Equalization. I have spoken to our legislatures. I called the Governor's Office. I spoke with the Department of Revenue. I have had conversations with John Roberts, our, our Councilman. My government needs to come up with a plan and it is my understanding that my legislatures need to draft law to help individuals, businesses, where municipalities were selectively shut down and deprive them of that right to generate revenue. There is one suggestion. Late fees need to be waived during this time frame for at least six months. Summer revenues look bleak. In 2008, Iceland told the international bankers that they were not paying their debt owed. They rewrote their constitution so they could never get themselves in that type of that degree of debt. Then they jailed their politicians. Iceland is doing great. I believe there's a lesson in Iceland's handling of their 2008-2011 financial crisis. I leave you with a question. Which amendment is this? No person shall be deprived of liberty or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Thank you for your time and your attention to this matter. I look forward to your response. Then I will also read the deparation of rights under the color of law. Section 242 of Title 18 makes it a crime for any person acting under, under the color of any law to willfully deprive a person or the right or privilege protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States. For the purpose of Section 242, acts under the color of law include acts not only done by federal, state, or local officials with their lawful authority, but also acts done beyond the bounds that the official, official's lawful authority. If the acts are done while full, sh why, if the acts are done while full sh officials is purporting or pretending to act in the performance of hers or her official duty, person acting under the color of law within the meaning of this statute includes police officers, prison guards, other law enforcement officials, as well as judges, care providers, and public health facilities and others who are acting in public officials. It is not necessary that a crime be motivated by anonymous towards a race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familiar statues, or national origins of the victim. The offense, anyways. What you guys did is you guys declared eminent domain over a select portion of our community. <laughs> that eminent domain was used for public health. I believe, and I should be compensated for that time frame. Thank you. Next is Bob Fuchs. Hi, I'm Bob Fuchs with the Firehouse Brewing Company. Um, I've been in full support of everything that the decisions that the Rep City Council and the Mayor have made all along. I think everything was very logically thought out. Uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, you all listened to the different comments that were made and I think good decisions were made. Um, I'm up here now saying and asking that May 31, the restrictions be allowed to end. I believe the goal of the restrictions was to get the, the coronavirus infections under control in the fact that we're flattening the curve. We didn't think we could ever knock out coronavirus. We just wanted to flatten the curve so that way the hospital could keep up and that it would not be overrun. We've accomplished that goal. We've accomplished that goal to the point where the hospital is laying off people. As a restaurateur, um, I believe it is in my best interest for to keep the guests safe and keep my employees safe. And if, if I'm not doing that, people are not gonna come back. They're not gonna wanna come back. I'm not here to wanna open today. I don't think it would be a good idea to take the restrictions off of my place today. But that should also be my decision. I wanted my guests coming back and I think that what we're doing now with the spacing requirements and the masks being worn by all our employees, 
those are all good decisions and they're all things we're going to continue to do going forward but that's a free enterprise decision the stimulus loans that we have in place will run out early june we've been granted the right the ability to, to have 50 percent of our business open this is not enough for us to keep from going out of business with the stimulus package we were able to to keep afloat for now but when that stimulus package ends we're all going to be losing money on a daily basis and it won't take long until we're out of business i agree with nick in the fact that uh, if we're being told that we have to close our businesses and and for me being told i'm operating at 50 percent is the same thing as being told i should close so if that's the case, the property taxes and the liquor license fees and these other fees, I believe the city council should be writing me a check for those fees. And by the way, we can't just say, hey, that's a state and county function. They're not shutting us down. The city is. I have many college kids that we hire every year after year after year. I have not been able to hire them back because we, did, we cannot fully open. Those people do not get unemployment, they're not eligible, and without coming to work for us, I've had many people tell me, many college kids tell me, they won't be going back to college here in the fall. They're done, they're done with their college career. I'd also like to mention the parking meters. We're looking at the possibility of raising those back up, but at the same time telling us we can't open our business. That seems very illogical. Um, I believe this is an extremely important issue, and because it's so important, we're looking at, I've, I've heard that we're looking at going out to July 31 with this. Uh, I don't think that should be the case. It's one thing to say, okay, an ordinance in place so that we can do things, I get that. But as far as actually putting the restrictions on, I'd ask that we don't do that. Um, and if we insist upon it, it should be for no longer than two weeks. This is an extremely important issue, which has dire consequences to a lot of business owners. And I think it's well worth being brought up every two weeks at these city council meetings. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That'll bring an end to the public comment period. And on to item number 26 under ordinances. Item 26, first reading, Ordinance 6418, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, um, a request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Low Density Residential District for property generally described as being located at 4039 and 4052 Winslow Place. Motion to approve, Drew, second by Lehman. All in favor, say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 27, first reading, Ordinance 6419, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Low Density Residential District for property generally described as being located at 4122, 4134, 4146, 4158, and 4170 Wisconsin Avenue. Motion to approve Drury, uh, second by Stroman. All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 28, first reading ordinance 6420 and ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from office commercial district to low density residential district for property generally described as being located at 3622, 3626, 3632, 3636, and 3700 City View Drive. Motion to approve by Drew, second by Armstrong. All in favor of that item say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 29, first reading of ordinance 6424, an emergency ordinance extending the date by which the city can implement measures necessary to slow the community spread of coronavirus, COVID-19. Committee recommendation was to send to council without recommendation. And I'd like to call on our city attorney, Joel Andine, just to give uh, 
a basic synopsis of why this ordinance is on the agenda. Thank you, Mayor. The purpose of the ordinance is not to extend the restrictions so much as to extend your ability to adopt regulations by resolution and also to uh, lessen or remove those same regulations by resolution. Uh, when we first adopted the emergency ordinance, I know a lot of people felt having the two readings and five days between readings uh, was a benefit and it gave people time to see what you were doing and understand that. A resolution, however, can be approved with one reading. Um, an example of how that can work uh, effectively is when you decided to allow uh, the restaurants to begin on-site service again. You were able to do that via resolution. Uh, it took one reading, one meeting, and it didn't take five days intervening in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Just because the ordinance goes to July 31st does not mean that we need to have restrictions till July 31st. Uh, you could certainly decide to remove restrictions uh, prior to July 31st via resolution and then the benefit of extending the ordinance to July 31st is if something were to happen and the hospital were having issues or it did appear that uh, community spread was increasing to the point where you felt like you needed to take action again, you could do so quickly without the five days intervening. If the ordinance is allowed to expire on June uh, 6th or 7th, I can't remember the exact date off the top of my head, uh, then if at some point in later June or July, you were to want to again impose additional regulations, uh, you would have to adopt a new ordinance and it would take five days between readings. So, and I would also point out that if you allow the ordinance to expire on June 6th or 7th, all, all restrictions, all regulations would go away. So there would, essentially we would be back to normal as far as the law is concerned. We could recommend to people that they take certain action, but there would be no requirement and there'd be no way to enforce it. Okay, thank you. The floor is open for discussion or motions. Darla Drew. Um, I have a couple of questions for Nick, if I could please. Nick? So while you were out of business, did you take any measures to apply for any of the um, federal funding? Did you receive anything? Sure, absolutely. We applied for the PPP and we failed uh, two times. Failed? Do you, do you know yeah, why? Yeah, because, because of, uh, uh, don't quote me here, but I think it's the 941s in regards to we had international workers. So they were included. They couldn't be included, so it was sent back. And then when we applied for the PPP, one of our properties made it. The next one, there was no more money within a 20 minute window. Yeah, yeah. Now we did get the money and he's correct uh, of the firehouse. I mean, this bought us some time until basically June 15th, June 20th and it's a godsend. Mm -hmm. I don't know what we would do without it. Did your employees come back? Did all your employees come back? Uh, yes, and that was, um, that's been very exhausting dealing with the South Dakota Department of Labor, the Federal Department of Labor. But, you know, here's, here's one issue that I'm currently dealing with. I mean, Monument Health is telling people, well, you took a bus ride and the bus driver got, he tested positive for COVID. Stay home. Okay, there's not many people out there. The labor pool is not plentiful. People, for some odd reason, are staying home. We had another employee who basically... Well, I think for some reason is COVID. Well, the saying. brother brother worked at the sewer plant. She's been quarantined. She ended up going to the hospital for basically anxiety, mm -hmm. and she tested negative. Mm -hmm. So people are being sent home. They can't go to work because Monument Health is out there and Susan telling people stay home for 14 days. I mean, it's getting to the point where it is exhausting and it is difficult. And, I, and most of the stuff I read, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, you're, you know, a lot of people out there are saying staying at home and quarantine. Quarantine's for the sick. We're supposed to build immunity. Mm -hmm. And just to let you guys know, I mean, you guys have the homeless shelter. You know, I think it's great that's going to help out. Just a real quick comment. 
But are any of those people that are going to stay at the homeless shelter released from the prison? Because, you know, there's people getting killed right now for all these prisoner releases. So I hope the city's aware that when the homeless shelter opens up, I hope nobody dies down there. So you think that the prison releases are resulting in murder? Do you have any way of, of justifying uh, Dallas, that Texas, statement? it took place. And, uh, I mean in Rapid City. Denver. No. In Ra okay. No. All right. No. We, I want to make sure that we don't yeah. confuse anything here. Okay. That, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions for um, Bob as well. So, and, and you went ahead and got the PPP and all that stuff too. You applied for that. How did that go for you? Correct. It went, we, we actually did. It went well for us. It worked well. We worked with our banker and, and we got it through. Um, they did a great job for us. And, and yes, it was a huge godsend that we got that. Um, we do have to use the way it's set up. We have eight weeks to use that up. Eight weeks will be over for us June 12th. And then we'll begin at 50% occupancy will begin losing money. So you can define to me um, why you say you lost so much money if you were getting money to make your payroll? We're, we're hanging in there right now. It's, okay. It's June 12th when there's going to be a, when it will become an issue. And if that's extended, I mean, you know, um, probably, I think that there, there is that chance. So, so we're not really sure. And when you were talking about the kids that you hired every year. I mean, if they're college students, I see lots of hiring signs around. I, I, they're not very um, motivated if they're not looking elsewhere to get a job. I mean, I'm sure they love working for you. They're like part of your family. But I don't think it's rational to say that they won't go to college because they aren't working at the firehouse. Well, they do come back year after year. And it's important for them to come back year after year. And they've done it for several years in a row. Uh, and also to note that as a server for us, they make a lot more money than what they're going to make serving burgers at McDonald's. Yes, it's true. It's, it's better to be that kind of a waiter or waitress or server than, than uh, just, you know, working at the McDonald's. But, um, you know, some people just aren't going to come back, uh, Mr. Fuchs. They're just not going to come back. And, I, you know, personally, I'm not going to go out for quite a while. And so... And, and I like to go out. I like to go to places like yours. But I'm just, I'm not going to take that chance at this time. However, what our general, uh, what we're trying to achieve here is not just a slowdown for the hospital. But when tourists look at our area and see our numbers, I want them to come here. Right now we're on the upswing. And I want to keep this in place so that when they look out here, they still see that our numbers are relatively low. So that, that's my reasoning for trying to keep this in place as long as we can. I know it can't be forever, but if we look good, those people are going to come here and they're going to go to Mount Rushmore and they're going to be, in, they're going to be our tourists. Maybe they'll bring more COVID with them. I don't know. But right now, I'm, I'm trying to save the tourism season. I want to save our summer. And that's only, you know, what, two weeks away. So maybe we should revisit this every two weeks. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that. So thank you for your comments. But I really think that we need to to slow down and know that we're looking at the whole city. Your businesses are important, but we got lawyers, doctors, um, all kinds of different businesses here that don't rely on the public coming in and, and having a drink or having dinner. We have to protect everyone. And when we say we're in this together, that means we, everybody has to give up something. Everybody, the swim team has to give up something. Your business will have to give up something. That's how we're going to take care of this, not by just opening up the doors. We're in this together, and that means we all give a little. Thank you. And, and I am in agreement with you on that. I'm not saying I want to open up everything today. Okay, thank you. John Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm hoping that we can revisit this more than between now and July 31st. I think one of the things that I find interesting about this is, you know, here coming up, we have the emergency homeless shelter that's coming on the, coming up here soon, and we're going to be shutting that down the end of June so we can start preparing for events at the Civic Center in the beginning of July. Is that correct? July sometime? So we're going to look out for our own interest before we look out for the business owner's interest in Rapid City? It's kind of what it looks like. Anyway, you know, it, it's unfortunate because I really believe what Mr. Fuchs said. 
I think that the majority of businesses out there are going to maintain or do, you know, are doing a good job. You know, I know one thing about Nick's business before he was shut down, he was already getting ready to social distance in his bar. He'd taken out tables, he'd taken out stools, he'd put up sneeze guard, he, you know, had hand sanitizer, he was ready to do it, but we didn't give him that opportunity. And all along, I've been, had very much heartburn about this all along because I think that we shut down too soon. I don't know if the numbers would be any different if we hadn't shut down. You know, so far, everything that we've had, and recently, yes, we do have had an uptick, but it's interesting looking at where some of these cases are coming from, you know, Rapid Ride, Walmart, Walgreens, motels. These are all quote unquote essential businesses. These are businesses that would have never been shut down. So, you know, I still go out to eat. I'm happy that things opened up. You know, I went out and, went out and had uh, breakfast yesterday. Uh, we went out and went to a bar and had a drink the other night. You know, everybody seems to be social distancing in their businesses. They seem to be doing the things that we're recommending. And I don't see where there's any evidence of anything coming out of these businesses. Now, if we're, it, it, it worries me because of the fact that we're hurting a lot of people really badly. And you know, can I ask you a question real quick, Bob? And you know, and I know the PPP has been a godsend for you, but really that doesn't take care of a lot other than just your payroll. And I think most people don't realize, not only do you have payroll, but you have a lot of other expenses. So on that side, you are losing money, correct? Well, Quite a bit of money every day. Yeah, we're losing money. This is just a, a Band-Aid that helps us get through for the next few weeks. And, um, and uh, it, it definitely helped. It helped a huge amount. We're not making money. We have a quick Band-Aid, and it's getting us by for a little bit. You know, the, the big positive that I saw out of this and the different businesses that I frequent is that at least we put some people back to work. You're seeing some people out there that are working that were really struggling before this. And, you know, saying that everybody's got to take their part isn't necessarily correct. I mean, you look at the liquor stores, and they did fantastic through this. You look at Walmart, you look at Menards, you look at the places that were open, they were way up. So not everybody is, is taking a hit like some businesses are, but I appreciate everything you've done, Bob, and, and it'll come back around, I hope. Thank you very much. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Okay, floor's still open. For a motion or a discussion. Becky Drury. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just going to reiterate that when I voted for this, it was to give Monument time to get in place, and they are in place now. So I'm not really for extending the closures beyond tonight. Bill Evans. Thank you. Um, with all due respect to Mr. Roberts, we can't control what business people went into and how this virus affects different businesses in different ways. I know some businesses are thriving, others are suffering. I wish we could fix that. We can't. But what we can do is support policies that spread the hurt out among everybody in this country. And I know that the last few um, bills passed by Congress, the U.S. Legislators have been helpful to some people, not so much to others. There's another one coming before, bigger than the rest, that could be addressing some of these very issues that you have. Again, spread out among every citizen of the United States. Now what you can do is be proactive and call your US representatives and ask them to please support this stuff if you really feel you need to be helped. 
because some people are getting a lot of help, others are getting none, and it's time you actually looked at the problem and what solutions are being proposed, proposed out there and support them. And I think some pressure put to our uh, representatives from the state of South Dakota might help that. I know that the House is pushing for a bill. I know that the Senate is opposing it so far. So I think you can do a lot of good. Again, I reiterate, the South Dakota senators have a lot of pull. When you divide two senators by the number of people we have, they're a lot more powerful than the ones in Texas, California, New York, and Florida. So they do have some pull. And you have a lot of pull because you're much closer to them than the 45 million people of California are to their senators. So get out there and do what you can do to make this happen and maybe uh, we'll find some benefit to that and some of this hurt could be spread out among the whole population. Thank you. Greg Stroman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I listened to Joel's explanation of this by passing this um, ordinance. What we would do is we'd be giving ourselves the um, ability to um, make regulations to protect the public through July 31st. We do not have to um, uh, create any new regulations and we don't, don't have to um, extend any regulations. This just gives us the opportunity to um, act with some deliberate speed if um, the need arises. And um, I'm certainly willing to revisit this on a regular basis um, so we can kind of, because this whole situation is changing all the time. And uh, right now we're seeing more cases of coronavirus in Rapid City. Um, I don't know where that's going. Um, we have people predicting that we're, you know, we're still headed for a peak. But I think that it's just prudent to continue to have the ability um, to make regulations that would protect the public. And so um, I think that this uh, ordinance is, is a good idea at this time. Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Make a motion to approve, please. Second. Motion to approve, Lewis, second by Armstrong. I think Mr. Uh, Stroman did a great job of explaining why this is necessary. It's not necessarily something we'll, we'll have to enact even, but just have the ability to respond to the situation. It's pretty fluid at this point. And Mr. Um, Fuchs, I can say that <laughs> I've spent many a mis misspent hour and dollar in your, your place throughout the years. It's pretty much a city icon. I would want to do nothing to damage it by any means. I'm just trying to uh, look at it, you know, the, the greater good at this point. But I. You said yourself you're not prepared to, to go fully open at this point, and I'm more than willing to re re review this often, if that's what it takes. I've got no problem with that. And I think if everybody else up here has no problem, you know, renewing it, looking at it. But if you're not even willing to open up yourself right now, sir, I, I think, you know, I think it's something that we should take that at the heart as well. And as someone who's out there actually working it, you understand that, you know, that's kind of a situation. You can say something if you want to. Go ahead. Certainly don't want to take away your right to talk. It, it, I, I appreciate it, and, and I wouldn't open today, but there is a big difference when you're pushing this all the way out to July 31, and I have to come back here and beg you to take the restrictions off rather than having a discussion to push them forward. There is a big difference. And I, I can appreciate that, sir, but I, I, I think we've done a pretty good job of responding to community um, input at this point. I don't think we've done anything to, we've met several times more than we normally do. And I just, I think the idea of being here, we're just gonna be able to, you know, have that in place. We don't have to keep coming back every, you know, and, and redoing an ordinance every five days or whatever, how long it, it takes, you know, it takes two readings. So we have a resolution in place that allows us to make those adjustments. And if we find out this is gone, we can peel off the restrictions right away. We don't have to wait another, you know, five days or whatever. So I think it's important that we, we still try to do our best to um, help, you know, give the guidelines to the public. Don't make it a free for all. I think there's a lot of, people that would already kind of view this as, you know, this virus isn't really that bad here, and they're kind of picking and choosing, not saying you're in your business, sir, I'm just saying other places are out there, you know, not doing as good a job as maybe some others. So I think it's kind of, uh, you know, looked at as a, a guideline, but I don't think a lot of people are necessarily intimidated by the, the restrictions as much either. So I just think we need to be able to, to, to keep protecting, and I think that I don't, I've, I've lost the, the thought about locking down again. I don't have any desire to do that personally. I don't think we can hide forever, but I do think that just common sense restrictions and guidelines are vital for sure. 
So I, I just think, like I said, the virus is never going away, and the, the, the goal of getting monument ready for it is there right now. And if they start to get in trouble, then we're going to have to be able to respond to that quickly, and that's the purpose of this motion. So thank you. Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, question for Joel Landine, please. Okay. Joel, the conversation's kind of going in the direction of uh, revisiting this in every two weeks or something along that time schedule. Correct me if I'm wrong, is that this is the first reading of, a, of an ordinance, so we would be naturally coming back in about two weeks to take another look at this. Can I understand that correctly? Right. Second reading would be approved on June 1st. The next item is the resolution that continues the current regulations to June 7th, so it lines up with the, uh, the current emergency, so we don't have a gap. And then I would imagine June 1st, we'll revisit the reg uh, resolution as well to decide whether you want what restrictions you want beyond the June 1st meeting, if any. So I would bring up back an updated resolution that will address the actual restrictions or if you want, I mean, that would probably be the time then you could look at the June 1st meeting uh, to remove the restrictions if that's what you wanted or to modify the existing restrictions, maybe tweak them some on June 1st and address them at that time. Thank you, Joel. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, motion on the floor is for approval. We'll go to a roll call vote now. Lewis? Aye. Lehman? No. Drury? No. Evans? Aye. Drew? Aye. Nordstrom? Aye. Roberts? No. Stroman? Armstrong, Aye. motion passes six to three. Okay, thank you. On the legal finance committee items, item number 30, resolution number 2020-037, an emergency resolution extending resolution number 2020-034. Motion to approve by Drew, second by Armstrong, and this will approve the, this will extend and the current regulations to June 6th. So everyone is familiar. Bill Evans. I just want to add a little bit of something to what Mr. Stroman said a bit ago. Um, try to be data driven on this stuff. And next, our next door neighbors, Minnesota, are sitting 50th at per capita infections with 29.4 per 100,000 of this data I got yesterday, so it may not be current today, but it's pretty close. New York is at the other end, number one per capita with 998 cases per 100,000. South Dakota is sitting at number 20 nationwide with 98 of 100 about per 100,000 people. That's not a good place to be, and the reality is in terms of growth of infection, South Dakota right now, as of last night, has the distinction of being number one in terms of virus growth. Now, if you think you're gonna get people to come visiting here when we've got a reputation like that out there, I think you're mistaken. And that is something we've gotta get under control, and that's the reason I think these restrictions and people enforcing them and the people going out to bars and restaurants and everything else taking care of it so that growth stops is the most important thing that happens because number one in this particular category is not a happy distinction for South Dakota. Um, Nebraska's down around 42nd. They've had a lot of bad press, something like that. But we're sitting here with this nasty, you know, rating in terms of that important statistic. So I think you need to start studying those things. And I apologize if they're not current today, but they were current as of Saturday night. So check it out. And uh, that's the reason I'm going to continue to support this resolution. Thank you. Okay, motion on the floor is to approve item 30. Let's go to roll call, please. Roberts. Stroman, Aye. Armstrong, Aye. Lewis, Aye. Lehman, no. Drury, no. Evans, Aye. Drew, Aye. 
Nordstrom. Aye. Motion passes six to three. Okay, thank you. Item 31 is an alcoholic beverage license application. There's 56 applications in this one item. Uh, if the council is satisfied uh, with these 56, we can vote on this in one in one item. Okay, we have a motion by Armstrong for approval, second by Roberts to approve item 31. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> now on to item 32. This is a presenta presentation on the uh, recommended changes to the 2020 budget, and I'm going to go down to the podium here for that. The city always approves its budget months in advance of the calendar year that uh, we're budget budgeting for. So this 2020 budget was approved in September or so of last year. And um, now with the pandemic, we've seen lowered revenues, lower than budgeted revenues. So therefore it's necessary to make an adjustment to our spending plan. So this is a presentation on, on my recommendation for the 2020 budget reduction. And if the council uh, is on board with this plan, then I will bring an ordinance to that effect at a later council meeting. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, first of all, some refreshers on the budget, what our city budget is made up of, the general fund which is the general operating fund of the city, accounts for all the financial transactions for uh, everything unless they're required to be reported otherwise. And the, a good example of um, general fund city services are police, fire, library, parks and rec, uh, and so on. Also, there are special revenue funds used to account for the proceeds of specific revenue sources that are restricted uh, to expenditures for specific purposes, and that is CIP, Capital Improvement Program, Vision Project, and so on, restricted by law that we passed here in the city. Next, enterprise funds, the closest thing government has to a business operation, where they account for overhead, their revenues pay their operating costs. Uh, we have the Civic Center, uh, solid waste, water, um, water reclamation, uh, and so forth. Enterprise fund uh, reductions do not benefit the general fund. So I'm um, just spelling this out. If, if we cause the uh, water department to cut their budget based on this pandemic, uh, it won't benefit the general fund at all. The water department's uh, got a mechanism to fund themselves. So when we have a overall city budget dilemma that needs solved and we only focus on the general fund, then the appearance of that lack of uniformity in the reductions may be seen as sloppiness, but in reality, it's a very targeted approach. We're targeting the fund that is damaged by the pandemic. So the general fund is the issue today. So that's the entire preamble to this whole uh, presentation. So the projected shortfall comes to us for several reasons. Corporate closures of large stores. There are a number of large retailers that were closed by the head office somewhere else. And some remain closed today. Voluntary and mandated closures of certain businesses uh, here locally. Uh, just for example, there were a number of restaurants that closed or limited service prior to the city council enacting an ordinance at the end of March. Weakened consumer confidence uh, on two fronts, not just not sure about uh, whether or not they're going to have enough money, but also not sure if they're going to remain healthy 
if they continue with their normal uh, retail behavior. So the consumer uh, has the final vote in all of the uh, success of our businesses uh, out there in the real world. The COVID-19 fear of impact on self and family. Uh, this fear causes more people to stay home. Unemployment is rising and that all equals lower spending, which equals lowered sales tax revenues. And as you might remember from the 2020 uh, budget presentation, our general fund revenue is made up of several pieces to the revenue pie, the largest of which is sales tax at 44%, second largest property tax, 28%. And then there's a hodgepodge of other revenue service, uh, sources here that I'll get more specific with in just a minute. So our projected shortfall. Um, the revenue recalculation for 2020, this is kind of showing uh, how we got to this conclusion. Our finance officer, Pauline Sumption, worked with our economist, Jared McIntaffer, and they used a two-month model of moderate economic shock and four months of severe economic shock in their scenario. Uh, they were able to recalculate both our tax revenue as well as revenue for uh, services or products uh, sold, and that's how we got uh, to that conclusion. Now, everything you're going to see here is a projection. It's an estimation. In other words, it's a guess based on the information we have available, us, available to us today. So it's likely it will change, uh, and it's likely it will change because we get delayed sales tax receipts from the state. We don't get them in real time. We get them a month later. So we're, uh, we're short on real data coming in. We have projected data. But as real data comes in, we'll be able to modify our uh, estimation. This is also subject to the year-end property tax submissions. We are estimating at this point that about 10% of property owners will uh, fail or not be able to submit their property taxes by year's end. And so even that delay, if it's delayed into the next year, will cause a revenue shortfall for us. So we're projecting about 10%. And it's also subject to future economic activity over the next seven months. Uh, not many of us have that crystal ball to know exactly uh, how the retail environment is going to um, progress over the next seven months and we're this is our tourist season this coming weekend is the official start of tourism in South Dakota and uh, we're gonna have a sorry start to tourism so when that data comes in then we'll know more here are some of the numbers uh, you can see in the far left uh, column that is the the source uh, property tax, for example, following over the percent change is minus 10%, and the amount is the amount of the shortfall. So you can read those numbers. I don't need to uh, recite them all. The big number, of course, is tax revenue, and that's sales tax, uh, BBB tax. And then um, uh, you also see this is, a, this is a projected shortfall, but I'm showing you a gain in intergovernmental inter revenue of 36% or about a million dollars. And this has to do with government funding for uh, transportation and for uh, police uh, COVID response. So we're actually seeing an increase there. Uh, the other categories are all reductions. The uh, sales of goods and services, uh, the payment in lieu of taxes is because the enterprise funds are, uh, their revenue is down. And so we, the general fund, gets paid uh, a payment from them in lieu of taxes for the typical services uh, that are provided to all property owners. We're cutting that in half, not collecting the second half of the year. Um, and then uh, the total projected shortfall, 10.9% or $6,638,000 uh, that we need to remove out of the 2020 general fund budget 
in order to balance at the end of the year. So here's the reduction philosophy. Myself and the department heads work together on this. Uh, and it's a combination of one-time purchase delays that don't cause a disruption, um, uh, staff and program reductions, reductions to subsidies, delay of certain uh, capital improvement projects, and ultimately a one-time use of reserve funds. So getting right into the departments, we have human resources. We've reduced by $70,000, and in most of these department reductions, uh, the, the majority of them anyway, are from delayed hiring or uh, a decision not to fill openings for the remainder of the year uh, to come up with some uh, relief. So human resources, 70,000. Information technology, 42,000. City attorney, 6,000. And the mayor's office, 13,000. Uh, public works, $1.5 million, and it's broken down into streets, uh, $560,000, transit, $820,000, and that's because we're getting uh, COVID relief funds for transit operations, which is then going to free up that general fund money. Uh, and then engineering, traffic operations, and GIS all make up the $1.5 million out of public works. Community development, 317,000 uh, from various divisions. Same philosophy used as far as coming up with the uh, targeted reductions. Library, $324,000, uh, half, almost half salaries, the other supplies, services, etc. Police, $815,000. The police department has a large general fund budget. Uh, we've uh, identified $440,000 in overtime. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit uh, about a grant uh, that the police have uh, applied for and received. So um, we have other items uh, identified here to make up $815,000. And uh, along that public safety theme, the uh, dispatch or the emergency services communication center has also come up with $160,000 they will uh, not be requesting from the city this year. Fire department, $282,000 from a variety of sources within that department. Finance, $98,000 also from various uh, divisions. And the big one, uh, parks and recreation. I say big because more eyes are on this as we lead up to this presentation. Uh, a good share of the public comments have to do with uh, parks and recreation items. But um, uh, $1.4 million for parks and rec. Uh, parks itself, $273,000. What this really means is that we'll have less mowing, less upkeep, less flowers. We're hiring about half of the temporary seasonal employees that we normally will. We realize parks are important, and uh, so we're not abandoning them. We're just going to uh, do less with them. Uh, the cemetery, 35-5, uh, administration, and recreation is the lion's share of this. Uh, recreation, a million ninety-three thousand, and uh, so as we're looking at budget issues. Uh, we're only using a financial filter. <clears throat> How can we get to, to the end? How can we achieve the goal of reducing the budget in a way that allows us to make it through the end of the year? So all of these recreation issues were only filtered through the financial filter. They were not filtered through the COVID-19 filter. So what I'm going to show you now is based 100% on the financial necessity. And that is the recreation programs will be suspended until September 1st. The ice arena will remain closed until September 1st. The swim center will remain closed until September 1st. And the Sioux Park, Park View, and Horace Mann Park Pools 
will remain closed for the season. Now we just had a speaker talking about the, the kids and, and the people in general and how they need this type of activity and no one disagrees with that. It's just that there may be an illusion that because admission is charged that pools pay for themselves. But I'm here to tell you that those three pools in our city parks cost $385,000 over and above the revenue of admissions and, and concessions, and that comes directly out of the general fund. So the taxpayer is supplementing the kids swimming uh, at an amount of $5,000 per day, every day, seven days a week, for two and a half months. It just doesn't make financial sense given the state we're in. And uh, I know this is bad news and I may be uh, rambling too much about it, but uh, we just can't justify it. And um, I do know for a fact uh, Sioux Falls announced today that they're not opening their pools. Um, I only have heard of one city uh, statewide that's going to open their swimming pools. Um, and that particular city breaks even on swimming. So not the case for us. And by the way, the 385,000 figure that I mentioned, that's in a good year. That's in a year where everyone feels comfortable going to the pool and everyone can't wait till those hot days to go there and swim and we can't really predict uh, how much activity there will be at the pool. So our, our out of pocket for the sw those three swimming pools alone could be as high as 500,000. Okay, so subsidies. We applied a general 15% reduction on um, the majority of the subsidies, uh, and those include the Doll, the Doll Fine Arts Center, the Journey Museum, both senior centers, Search and Rescue, Lifeways, the Arts Contingency Fund, the Performing Arts, for a total of $94,000. There are some, some organizations that are officially, as far as our budget goes, listed as subsidies that we did not reduce. And those are things like the Cornerstone Rescue Mission, which has already had to decrease their capacity and are having trouble making ends meet. That becomes a, a, a primary function for this community, as well as working against violence, the Humane Society, and those other contract for services arrangements that we have with some of our providers. So everyone didn't get 15%. Um, now, uh, Capital Improvement Fund. The Capital Improvement Fund is generated by sales tax and it is a list, typically a five-year list of uh, improvements to be made. Uh, in talking with Public Works and the other departments who have items on this list, None of these items I'm going to show you now were scheduled to be built this year. Uh, so we are delaying these purchases and they will find their way back to a list when this is all done. So we start with a sweeper wash facility for the sweet street sweepers, 500000 The west side salt storage, it's exactly what it sounds like. The street department was going to build a building to house salt on the west side of town to save the trip over to the east side of town during the winter when they're using salt. Uh, the fire station one asphalt, uh, an amount uh, earmarked for when station one is rebuilt, uh, and that is not in the planning stage, stages yet, so we'll delay that one. Uh, cemetery roads and irrigation, there was gonna be some paving of roads partially uh, there's a partial um, bit of that project that's been done. The remaining here is 51,000. Parks, parking lot repair, uh, parks master plan and signage. There was some waypoint finding uh, as well, uh, also not scheduled. And bridge improvements, this is for bridges just within the park system, uh, not all through the city. Park security cameras. Uh, parks, restrooms, ADA compliance, there's a, a dream, an ongoing goal of getting all of our parks, restrooms up to ADA compliance. None of those projects were scheduled or bid uh, to be done in 2020. 
Uh, and the Canyon Lake stone wall, this is the stone retaining wall when you drive through Canyon Lake and there's a uh, short retaining wall near the road and um, also not planned, not, not contracted for this year. So 350 for a total uh, one-time reduction of $2,015,000. And then reserve funds. Uh, reserve funds are much like a savings account. Uh, by which money is set aside for certain things, such as revenue shortfalls, unanticipated expenditures, and to ensure stable tax rates. Uh, there are communities, one of them very close to us, that in losing a, a major, if they are to lose the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, they have already uh, itemized a number of uh, additional revenue that they'll have to get from the taxpayers uh, to be able to make their budget work this year. So these are the re reasons for the use of reserve funds. And um, so here's uh, the summary again of the proposal. The projected reduction in revenue, 6,638,000. The identified reductions in this presentation, 6,361,000. The difference being 276,000. So um, the council must be the one to decide whether to use or identify reserve funds to make up this $276,000. And in my own opinion, this pandemic appears to uh, check every box for justification for using reserves. So that is the presentation. And uh, if you want to have discussion, uh, we can certainly do that. And then I'll just need to know generally if you're on board. And I'll bring an ordinance back perhaps to the next council meeting. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Uh, yes, Richie Nordstrom. Thank you, Mayor. Um, if you don't mind if digging down into the weeds just a little bit with uh, a question to Mr. Bigler, please, on the Parks and Rec questions. Is he here? Oh, couldn't see him. <laughs> Camouflaged. Mr. Bigler, could you uh, address the point about what the mayor's presentation is has to do with the uh, not opening up the swimming pools and some of the rationale behind that? And also, uh, let me stop there and go ahead and make your presentation there. Uh, well, much as, as the mayor uh, alluded to, this is a, a decision that uh, uh, will save a great deal of money. Um, this is, these three pools uh, do not cover their expenses, never do. On a good year, they don't. Um, this year uh, would be uh, probably even something uh, that would be beyond uh, the loss that we would see in a good year uh, due to the restrictions that, that we would have to follow and that sort of thing. We would still incur the same expenses. Revenues would be even less than we would get on a, you know, on a good year. So. It makes, uh, it makes sense, although it's, it's a really difficult decision and it's certainly right. something we would, we would not like to see, uh, but it does make sense in this, in this instance. And then uh, just to follow up on that just a little bit is that, uh, is it possible that the Parks and Recs can look at some other alternatives? I understand you can't do anything for swimming pools, but um, uh, a neighborhood watch group got together and some of the things that they were coming up with uh, as alternatives. Um, is, is the Parks Department able to provide any alternatives? Uh, uh, the, what we were talking about a little bit was uh, something to do with Robbinsdale Park because it's uh, closely associated with uh, that neighborhood. So is there any possibility of kind of looking at new areas uh, or innovative suggestions for activities for the younger people within the community. Uh, you're talking about like volunteer activities? Or, or, yes, or, yes. Yeah. Or it, it, one f f example that came up was the BMX track. And, and uh, well, some of that conversation centered around that as well. And then, mm -hmm. and then the baseball fields that are over there uh, and, and uh, some other 
uh, activities. Uh, is the Parks Department able to do something like that? Well, the Little Leagues are uh, still operating. Uh, they're operating at a, a reduced uh, level at the moment, uh, and they hope to uh, increase their level of use of those uh, uh, ball diamonds and such uh, as the CDC recommendations loosen up a little bit as well. Uh, same with the BMX uh, track. They are still planning on operating and maintaining the social distancing and maintaining the, the crowd size and those sorts of things. So there are, there are still activities out there for kids. Parks are all still open as well. Uh, trails are still open. Um, and one other thing that I, I think we've talked about before, and that is uh, uh, using some of the volunteer labor in some of the areas that uh, we're yes. going to be deficient in, in uh, with the reduced staff. Uh, and we are looking at uh, um, uh, volunteer groups that might want to help out with uh, uh, litter pickup or, or uh, plant maintenance and things like that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bigler. And, and Mayor, I'm, I'm on board with these ideas of taking it not all from one bucket as well. So if all of this is, uh, is looked at and discussion was at CIP is that a lot of those projects can be deferred so that we aren't looking at cuts in the, the CIP project. So, um, so that different bucket, if you will, is, is easy to address. So um, the other part of it is uh, dipping into the reserves. Again, I'm more comfortable with doing that rather than taking everything out of one bucket of funding sources. So. Um, if you can mark me down as uh, wanting to take a look at your ordinance, I'd be very happy to uh, support what you're going forward with. Thank you. I yield. Okay. Darla Drew. Thank you, Mayor. Could I ask Chief Jagger a couple questions, please? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, Chief. Hello. Um, I noticed you guys were taking a pretty big hit. And um, uh, am I wrong when I say that there seems to be an uptick in some of the crimes around the area at this time? I see, you know, maybe it just grabs headlines, but the guns being stolen out of unlocked vehicles and, and those being used to perpetrate crimes, I mean, is that going up? So I, I actually did a workload analysis and the crime level is our results. Our workload is a, another factor. And I actually put together statistics for our presiding judge to help him understand how our, we temporary, temporarily relaxed our proactive policing for a period of a month. And that did have a negative impact on crime rates. Uh, our workload is down though. and. From a financial standpoint, that's your overtime rate. And we've also made some other changes to create additional efficiencies. Um, we're not doing special projects. We are focused on basic police services to ensure that we sustain the pandemic. And a result of that is lowered overtime. So I'm very comfortable with the, with the amount that was reduced. Um, we're able to manage our our workload a lot better now. If you had a choice to bring something back into your budget, what would that be? You know, like the mayor said, all the department directors work together and we all recognize the serious nature of the financial well-being of the city. All of the cuts that were proposed by the mayor, we've had conversations behind the scenes I understand it, I respect it. We're going to be able to continue to provide police services um, throughout the year. So I, I don't wanna ask for something um, outside of, of what is there on this calendar year. I will tell you that we recently had a, a meeting, um, mayor, finance officer, to discuss our West Sector Precinct, which is scheduled for 2024. We're talking about maybe moving that up to 2022, 2023 timeframe. So down the road, when you hear from me asking for a request, uh, remember that I yielded tonight, so. 
Um, do you work with the search and rescue, or is that mainly the fire department, or is that you guys? It's under the umbrella of the Pennington County Sheriff's Office, and well, so it's primarily utilized outside of the city limits just because of the terrain issues. Okay. Well, I do have a concern this summer with our pools being closed, and I don't mean to be the harbinger of doom, but I see more kids in the creek. And with that, is a, that's a big danger. And so when I think of your uptick in services this summer, I think you'll see some, some things that you'll have to address there. So please come back to us if you need more money for that kind of work this summer. Our last springs have shown us that the rains are incredible. We had a lot of snow this year. We're going to have, the creek's going to be high, and the kids are going to be in it, and teenagers and adults. And so I just think that's something we really need to keep an eye on, maybe even plan for, and think about that as a dangerous spot for, for our summer. That's it. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just take my mask off for a second so I can be understood. Um, so I just want to take an opportunity. First of all, I appreciate the, the cuts you made and all the department directors have gotten together to make because I think they show a minimal impact on the overall citizenry. I realize the pool is obviously a big deal, but um, it's one of the unfortunate ca casualties of this. But I would like to take a minute just to acknowledge the selfless act of our fire chief who has taken this opportunity to, as the highest paid member of the uh, staff to retire rather than ask other people in his, his position to do that in his, uh, his department as a matter of, you know, goes towards leading from the top, I guess. So he's doing a, I like the example of that. I mean, it's to be awarded, I mean, to be respected and acknowledged. I think it's just a, um, a very selfless act and the kind of stuff that he's obviously given to our community throughout the years. And so I just want to take a moment to, to uh, acknowledge that and th say thank you, sir. Yeah, I don't think he's here tonight, but. Becky Drury. Thank you, Mayor. Do you just need a motion to acknowledge this or a motion to approve? Yeah, you could, you could do that, and I would take that as a hint to bring back a city ordinance that reflects that presentation for you to, to pass as the new budget authorization. So moved. Okay, we have a motion to acknowledge and a second by Armstrong. Uh, Bill Evans. Thank you. Um, I just want to sort of reiterate what Darla said about the swimming thing as a former lifeguard for many summers here in the rec department. You know, I, I agree for the kids who can't do it, but frankly, uh, more than the economic thing, I don't know how you can run a public pool and keep it safe in terms of transmission right now. And if somebody thinks that up, maybe we could revisit that a little bit. But there are certain groups and certain activities just that lend themselves to high transmission. Now, this week, the municipal band has voted to not have a season. Same with the ranger band. You put all those people in one room blowing spit through everything, you're going to get it. And transmission rates of choirs and bands and people that have continued to rehearse and stuff across the country have been as high as 60 to 70 percent within those groups. So um, that's one of the reasons that's taking place. But I think when Mayor thoughtfully uh, went through this and listed what things cost and the savings that are, you know, found in different areas, people start realizing what living in a culture like this and a society like this actually does cost. And all the attributes we have living in a city, um, I bet most people did not know how much the public pools cost to run. You know, and we're somewhere in the middle when it comes to providing these amenities for our citizens. We don't spend the most, we don't spend the little, the least. I know over in Minneapolis where my brother lives, he's always complaining about the, the taxes. You know, they even plant the trees in your boulevard strips there. The city does that, they come in, they dig them up, they cut them, they do that. They're paying for that stuff. So we're somewhere between having all the attributes and none that I'm sure some cities do. So I'm actually very proud of what the mayor's come up with. I support his proposals and I'm, I'm very actually proud of the generosity of some of these departments and how they've stepped up to do this. So congratulations on that, thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to acknowledge. All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries, thank you. Now on to item 32A, to authorize funding for the emergency shelter up to $75,000 and I'll just give a little uh, brief um, on that and then we'll uh, turn it over to others. The emergency shelter that has been fit into the 
Rushmore Plaza Civic Center Rushmore Room uh, is something completely COVID related, designed for the chronic homeless who are very, uh, very vulnerable and generally non-compliant uh, population. And um, there has been about twenty-five or twenty-eight thousand uh, dollars in expenditures so far to get that up and running, and those have been uh, handled by uh, local groups and philanthropy, uh, the uh, in large part by the Vukurovic Foundation. And so now, as it sits empty tonight, uh, it could be opened at any moment. And if if it plays out that way, that we have a population of homeless over there, it will require 24-hour supervision. There will be food costs, health care costs, a number of things to isolate that population and care for them, and that will cost money. In all likelihood, there will be reimbursement for that money, either through the typical COVID uh, funds that are already made available, but also possibly through the $1.2 uh, billion dollars that the state has already uh, received from the federal government. So I see two probabilities of reimbursement there. And so uh, on the, in the group that works on this, no one is fearful that there won't be reimbursement. It's just needing that money up front to operate that facility for a period of time. And between Pennington County and the city of Rapid City, we've estimated it uh, to be uh, able to run for a period of time for $150,000. So city and county working together, uh, pledging half of that as operational costs. And this item is on the county commission agenda for tomorrow morning where they will discuss the same thing. So the uh, I'm asking for your authorization on this item to spend up to $75,000 $75, out of the city uh, to front the costs uh, when it's possible uh, little or none of this money will be needed, or if it is needed, that all of it will be reimbursed. And uh, there's probably further and a better explanation of what I just said. We have Dustin Willett in the audience. Uh, Dustin, do you need to add something to what you've just said, or to what I've just said? I explained it very, very well. I'm happy to stand for questions if there are other questions. Okay, Dustin's going to stand by for questions. And there are printed materials that you have that explain this, uh, uh, the makeup of this and it, the intent of the shelter. Uh, so, um, now that we have that uh, discussed a little bit, I'll go to John Roberts for comment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I just have a couple of questions, and I imagine they would go to you. Um, I'm just curious about, in the short term, how are we going to fund this? Where's this funding come from right now before we get anything back? Because we don't know for sure if we're going to get anything back or not. You're right, we don't know for certain, uh, but we uh, are confident that will happen. In the meantime, it could be taken out of reserves. It could be taken out of the emergency management budget. My uh, recommendation would be reserves. I think we should add that to that line <laughs> that you're bringing back for... Okay, all right, because I'm not against this. I know you shuddered when, when I came up to speak. <laughs> it's just habit. Um, yeah. So <laughs> my, my second question is what happens, and I'm sure this won't happen, Dustin, but what happens if tomorrow morning the county says, we vote this in tonight, and the county says, we're not going to fund our portion? Well, good question. Uh, we could either run it halfway for a while, or we could pull it back off the table. Uh, so I don't, I don't have a good answer for that question. Okay, that was just a question. So, you have any thoughts, Dustin? Uh, the two immediate things that jump to mind are, uh, one, um, I am hopeful uh, for a, a favorable disposition from this council tonight, and I am equally as hopeful for a favorable disposition from 
the county commission tomorrow morning. I, I, uh, um, uh, and I'm hopeful I hit the Powerball next week, but that <laughs> doesn't really mean much. Uh, but with that being said, um, certainly you would have to de decide, as, as the mayor alluded to, whether or not you wanted to carry on in absence of a partnership with the county. Uh, however, it could also be contingent upon uh, the county's participation tomorrow. So if, if you were to, to authorize, you could authorize that, I would imagine, uh, upon the contingency of the county participating. Thank you very much, and I think that might be a good idea. Thank you. Okay. Chad Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to say once again uh, how, how much I appreciate your work, Dustin, and your, your group of people, everybody that's worked on this. Uh, did a great job, went down and got a chance to tour it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's a great facility. Unfortunately, we need it, or hopefully we won't need it much, but I think we're going to need it. And if you know, I just I urge people to think about if they're not a big fan of you know doing this, well, think of it as an investment as a way to keep more people healthy and less chance of yourself getting infected. And, and if you can't think from the humanitarian side of these people don't have a place to go to be sick, you know, I mean, it's just it's just the right thing to do. And I, even if we get stuck with the bill, I, it's just the right thing to do. And I definitely appreciate. Once again, your work and everybody else that's done uh, all they can, and I would definitely support this 100%. So, thank you. Darla Drew. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I really appreciate all the work, and I, I love this idea, and I think it moves us towards that more compassionate community or most compassionate community in the nation as Ray Hillebrand envisioned us. Um, Dustin, I had one or two questions for you, though, please. I, I see on your tier three where you have 20 beds. That is for the COVID um, confirmed, yes, correct? And so, in that case, do they not get to leave? Are they are are they required to stay until they're better? Because we don't want to release them back into the population. How do we make them stay? It's a, a great question, not a great answer. Tricky question. So, in the cases and uh, talking with this thing is challenging. It's hard, yeah. <laughs> um, in the cases that have occurred across South Dakota, uh, primarily East River, with people who are non-compliant, uh, and as we heard earlier today, uh, this truly uh, can fall into the realm of, of, of mandated isolation and quarantine. If the, if the Department of Health or a medical professional has told that person that they need to uh, quarantine or isolate for a period of time, the cases that have, that there's only been a, a, a very, very small number of people who've been non-compliant with that. And in those cases, uh, it, between the Department of Health, the Department of Health can issue a public health order, which is then enforceable through law enforcement and the judiciary. So our state's attorney, uh, the sheriff's office, uh, and their counterparts across the state continue to wrestle with how best to do that. So they've, they've used um, a combination of things, including uh, electronic monitoring uh, to try to help enforce uh, some type of compliance once the Department of Health issues a, a public health order. Uh, but our approach currently is to provide the most supportive environment that is reasonable uh, to, to offer a place that is attractive for them to coalesce, or, or I'm sorry, convalesce. Uh, so the, the the hope is that we provide for their needs, uh, their basic needs, to a point where they choose to stay, knowing that, that um, addictions and, and other behaviors are difficult to control. There's not a perfect answer to that, but mm -hmm. uh, those discussions are ongoing with the, the sheriff's office and the state's attorney. So if you have somebody with COVID that really wants to leave, and that's going to be exactly the opposite of what the effect we want here, can they be transferred to the hospital? Uh, I would imagine that's certainly a possibility, but probably comes with the same caveat. Uh, just like you're not going to be handcuffed to a cot in the Rushmore room, you wouldn't necessarily be handcuffed to a, a gurney in the hospital in that particular case either. So I think the challenge is the same regardless of the facility that that uh, potentially non-compliant person would be in. Well, I just hope they're sick enough to not go out <laughs> and that they would take advantage of this great situation. So thank you very much. I yield. Richie Nordstrom. Uh, a couple of questions for uh, Dustin, if I may, please. Yes. 
Dustin, uh, is, is this item going to be on the LAPC agenda Wednesday? Uh, the agenda for the LAPC um, Local Emergency Planning Committee, uh, uh, we, as part of our legal requirement for the grant funding or the, the, the allocation of funds that we receive uh, for that committee, are required to have four uh, annual meetings. Uh, there's no clause that allows us to not have four annual meetings. So that agenda has been kept intentionally very, very light to, to simply facilitate the, the quarterly meeting. So right now I don't think anything uh, extra is on the agenda. However, there is always a period for comment. Uh, so if you want to bring that up for discussion, uh, it would certainly be, be discussed by the group. But that, that meeting will be virtual, be uh, uh, hosted electronically. Yep, I plan on attending, and, and uh, I'll know more after we hear from the county tomorrow as well. Um, uh, thank you for working with the Homeless Coalition group on this. The, uh, is, I don't know, the backbone or the groups that got together and said uh, we're going to need some help. So thank you for stepping up for doing this uh, in partnership with the uh, Homeless Coalition because they've been asking me about this for quite some time and so I just want to applaud the uh, uh, emergency management folks for uh, stepping up. And then the last question, uh, during the tour that we had of the facility, uh, were you able to get the ADA issues addressed? <laughs> Again, not a, a, a perfect answer. The answer is as best as we're able to. So each shower room that has multiple shower stalls, one of those shower stalls in each of those shower rooms has a ramp with uh, a grip tape, a, a bar mounted uh, at the appropriate height in the shower, and then the shower head put on a, a flexible gooseneck oh, okay. uh, hose. So uh, if, if ADA came in and, and measured and did inclinometers, it probably is not, uh, would probably not be blessed as 100% ADA compliant, uh, but we've made the, the absolute best, most reasonable accommodation that we can to provide for that. If I remember right, you're, you've got a closing date, intended closing date of June... Uh, June 26th? Yes. And it is, uh, so I, I see this as a minor issue anyway, so your attempt to get something compliant is, is admirable, so thank you. I, I believe that's all I have, Mayor. I, I can support the motion. Bill Evans. Um, to... Um, Go along with what Mr. Roberts said some time ago. I'm looking at the date for closure and evidently that it seems somewhat peculiar um, given the fact that most of the, uh, you know, problem curves we've seen projected, this falls right in the middle of that. And I'm wondering, was it just based upon um, the facilities availability? Uh, by the way, I think in touring it, it's awesome. I think the level of preparedness on part of all these agencies plus the hospital has been kind of magnificent, so we're ready for anything to happen. But it's a rather bizarre date as far as I'm concerned that that falls right when that does. And I'm wondering if there's a chance these facilities may not be used with things being canceled all the time. Is there any plan for extending it? So I guess the question are, why was that date chosen and could it be extended? Thank I can you. answer that. Um, the date was chosen uh, because of the speed that things are moving during this pandemic. So when this was being planned, uh, all of the May dates had been canceled, all of the June dates had been canceled, but the July dates had not been canceled yet. So everyone with fingers crossed, specifically everyone at the Civic Center with fingers crossed, hoped that uh, we may have seen the worst of this and there may be some events that could take place in July. And every day and every week that we get closer to that, uh, it really just becomes uncertain. We just talked this morning about those dates uh, in July. And uh, so the reason that the date is still the end of June for closure is because no one's made the official determination yet that we'll cancel the events for July. So 
if the scenario arises where we've got a number of patients over in that shelter, I think that's going to be a decent barometer for whether or not the entertainment environment is suitable for events over in that building and that date then would be changed. If the, um, if the center goes uh, empty, uh, things start to dwindle, then it could be a, a different scenario. So it's, uh, it's slightly sophisticated guesswork that went into the date. Anything else, Bill? Okay, Be Becky Drury. Do we have a motion, Mayor? No, we don't. I'd like to make a motion that we fund up to $75,000 to be taken out of the reserve fund towards the temporary emergency homeless shelter. Contingent on anything? No. Contingent on the county funding it tomorrow morning? No, somebody could amend it if they'd like. Okay. All right, we have a motion. Uh, who seconded? Lance Lehman seconded uh, to take, uh, designate up to $75,000 from reserves to go to the emergency shelter. Uh, all in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Now, on to staff items. Item 33, Rapid City Coronavirus Emergency Response. Chief Carl Jaggers. Do you have a presentation? I'll just note that the documents are attached to the agenda. They're linked. Um, the summary is that um, the Department of Justice put out a coronavirus emergency supplemental funding program, and we applied for it. It was fast-tracked. It was already awarded for $240,000. So essentially, we need approval for the mayor and finance officer to accept the award and sign the award document. Motion approved by Roberts, was it? And a, and a second by Becky. Becky. Can't see any of your lips move. <clears throat> okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Item 34, authorize mayor and finance officer to sign settlement agreement with Darren Haar. Motion to approve by Drew, second by Lewis. Uh, all in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Public hearing items uh, 35 through 50, there are no speaker requests, so we won't have a public hearing. Consent, there's only one consent item, which is item 35. There will be a motion to approve that item. Motion by Lewis, second by Armstrong to approve 35 under alcohol licenses. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Non-consent public hearing items. Item 36, a request by John Gomez for Alta Terra development for a resolution to approve tax increment district number 70, project plan amendment number two, to reallocate project plan costs for property generally described as being located at Catron Boulevard from 5th Street to South U.S. Highway 16, then south along U.S. Highway 16 to Samus Trail and east to the proposed Highland Crossing subdivision. Motion approved, Lewis, second by Roberts. All in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 37, second reading, Ordinance 6389, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Medium Density Residential District for property generally described as being located at 324 East New York Street. Motion to approve Drury. Second by Lehman. All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 38, second reading, Ordinance 6390, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Medium Density Residential District for property generally described as being located at Settlers Creek Place. Motion approved by Drew. Second by Drury. All in favor of that motion say aye. 
Opposed? Motion carries. Item 39. Second reading, Ordinance 6391, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. A request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Medium Density Residential District. For property generally described as being located west of Sunny Springs Drive between Wesleyan Boulevard and Harmony Heights Lane. Motion by Nordstrom. Second by Drury. All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, item 40, second reading, Ordinance 6392, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Medium Density Residential District for property generally described as being located east of Sunny Springs Drive and south of Wesleyan Boulevard. Motion approved by Drew. Second by Nordstrom. All in favor of approval say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 41, second reading, Ordinance 6393, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Low Density Residential District 2, for property generally described as being located at the eastern terminus of Table Rock Road. Motion to approve by Lehman, second by Nordstrom. All in favor of approval say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 42, second reading, Ordinance 6394, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to High Density Residential District for property generally described as being located at 311 Quincy Street. Motion to approve Nordstrom, second by Drury. All in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 43, second reading, Ordinance 6395, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. A request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Low Density Residential District 2 for property generally described as being located at 918 Meadowood Drive. Motion to approve by Drew. Second by Armstrong. All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 44, second reading, Ordinance 6397, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Low Density Residential District for property generally described as being located at 4084 and 4282 Tower Road. Motion approved by Drury, second by Nordstrom. All in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 45, second reading, Ordinance 6400, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning request from Office Commercial District to Low Density Residential District 2 for property generally described as being located at Horizon Point north of Tower Road. Motion approved by Drew. Second by Nordstrom. All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Second reading, Ordinance 6414, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 uh, of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by Renner Associates, LLC, for Creek Drive Land, LLC for a rezoning request for medium density residential district to general commercial district for property generally described as being located at 415 North Creek Drive. Motion to approve Nordstrom, second by Drury. All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 47, second reading, Ordinance 6415. An ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by Dream Design International for Black Hills Capital LLC for a rezoning request from General Agricultural District to Low Density Residential District 2 for property generally described as being located north of Philadelphia Street, east of East Anamosa Street. Motion to approve Lehman. Second by Drew. 
All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 48, second reading, Ordinance 6416, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. A request by Dream Design International for Yasmin Dream LLC for a rezoning request from general agricultural district to medium density residential district for property generally described as being located west of Elkvale Road at the terminus of Orchard Lane and the recommendation from committee is to approve in conjunction with the approval of a plan development designation. Okay, motion to that effect from Drury. Second by Nordstrom. All in favor of that motion say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 49. Second reading, Ordinance 6417, an ordinance amending Section 17.06 of Chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, a request by Stephanie Crows for a rezoning request from Park Forest District to Low Density Residential District 2 for property generally described as being located at 828 3rd Street. Motion by Nordstrom and a second by Roberts for approval. Uh, all in favor of that motion say aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, item 49 passes uh, with one no from Darla Drew. Uh, item 50, second reading of Ordinance 6294, an ordinance amending, uh, I'm sorry, an ordinance amendment, amending chapter 17.40 to revise permitted and conditional uses in the office commercial district. Motion to approve by Drew, second by, was it Nordstrom? All in favor of approval say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item 51, the bill list, and we'll go to Finance Officer Pauline Sumption. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. There are no additions to the bill list, so the total is that which is attached at $5,872,705.44. Motion to approve by Nordstrom and a second by Armstrong. Uh, all in favor of approval of item 51 say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Motion to adjourn by Armstrong. Second, Roberts. All in favor say aye. aye. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.